Good evening and welcome to the UVA Club of Athens evening with Professor Grace. Uh, thank you all for joining tonight and I hope everyone is safe and well. My name is Joshua Stewart. I am the Assistant Director for the UVA Clubs and Global Engagement. I am a Wahoo class of 18 as well. Uh, before we get started, I would like to go over a couple house rules. Um, like I already said, if you're joining late, feel free to input your uh, name, background, and UVA affiliation, as we like to know who's in the room, H-O-O-S, who's in the room, um, as, well as, the, as well as the dogs here. I, I'm seeing a lot of uh, go dogs in the group chat, and I'm sure Grace welcomes that. Uh, yeah. Second, throughout the talk, um, feel free to ask any questions you have in the Q&A box, which is located at the bottom of the screen to the left, separate from the chat. Um, and if you see any questions that you're particularly interested in, be sure to use the upvote. Um, we will try to get to as many questions as we can at the conclusion of the presentation. Uh, and now I'd like to introduce Professor Grace Hale. Grace Hale is an award-winning historian and writer who teaches at the University of Virginia, an internationally recognized expert on modern American culture and the regional culture of the U.S. South. She has written for the New York Times, the Washington Post, American Scholar, and CNN's website, as well as the websites and publications focused on the South, including Southern cultures and Southern, Southern spaces. She's traveled and spoken everywhere. I could go down the list, but she has, she is world renowned. Uh, in her research, Hale examines how people in the past have used stories, images, and artifacts to understand themselves and their worlds. She has worked on the history of popular music, documentary film, photography, and social and political movements. In particular, she has written and spoken about the stories and images Americans use to think about race and racial difference and its power as a political and economic problem and an imaginative challenge. Hale is a native of Georgia, where she grew up in Atlanta before moving to Athens. There, she earned her undergraduate and graduate degrees at the University of Georgia while playing in a band and co-founding and running a cafe slash music venue slash gallery. Um, she left Athens to earn a PhD in U.S. history at Rutgers. And today, she lives in Charlottesville with her husband, the photographer, and our professor, William Wiley, and her two daughters. Grace, the floor is yours. All right, thanks so much, Joshua, and thanks to Neil for, for taking care of our technology needs, and thanks to everyone who's here. Um, I'm gonna start out by just reading a little bit from the very beginning of Cool Town, and then just go over some of what I think are the major themes and why I wrote this book. Uh, then I'm gonna play a couple of clips, maybe three or four clips of um, really early moments in famous Athens band uh, history and famous bands from Athens history. And then um, we're gonna open up the floor to Q&A. So I don't wanna take too much time. I wanna give you guys a chance to ask questions and really grateful to such a great turnout tonight. Um, and thank you for coming. And I hope there's some people out there that are actually in Athens. So if you are, shout out to you. In Athens, Georgia in the 80s, if you were young and willing to live without much money, anything seemed possible. Magic sparkled like sweat on the skin of dancers at a party or a club. Promise winked underfoot like the bits of broken glass embedded in the downtown sidewalks. A new world seemed to be emerging out of our creativity, our music and art, and our politics, but also the way we understood ourselves and related to each other. In my memory, the weight of the air on summer nights made possibility seem like a substance I could hold in my hand. Always local bands played and people listened at practice spaces and house parties and venues like the 40 Watt. People went to hear their roommate or boyfriend or coworker play one night and urged everyone to come and see their group the next. Easy to make and easy to hear, live music was everywhere. We used it to reinvent and express ourselves and connect with each other. We used it to live. After the clubs let out, the scene kept moving until dawn. Small groups climbed the fences at apartment complexes. No one would admit to living in one and went skinny dipping. Sometimes people walked to a big Victorian house on Hill Street and danced to mixtapes in the hall between the rolled back pocket doors until their clothes dripped with sweat and their heads spun. Occasionally at midnight, a small drama troupe performed an original play up and down the aisles of the 24 hour Kroger. 
Film buffs too young to see movies like Sleeper and Raging Bull when they came out, watch them for free in the air-conditioned quiet of the seventh floor of the University of Georgia's library. Often people paired up, going home with the person they were seeing or an acquaintance or someone they had just met. One perfect July night, I lay naked with a friend on the cool cement floor of a screen porch as the wet heat thinned and the crickets rasped and we talked about music until dawn. Possibility proved more addictive than the beer everyone drank and the drugs many people took. We were unlikely people in an unlikely place. No one expected us to do these creative things. No one who mattered thought that we could make a new kind of American bohemia. Yet Athens kids built the first important small town American music scene and the key early site of what would become alternative or indie culture. We had grown up anything but alternative. Home was a new version of the South created by desegregation, interstates, air conditioning, and airports. Our parents had mostly enjoyed the rewards. Our schools practiced a form of neglect that suggested that racial integration was easy, feminism unnecessary, and gay sexuality non-existent. None of that was true, of course, but white middle-class kids often got to skate over the consequences. On some vague level, we sensed we were living in a changed and changing world, and yet the adults around us seemed to be in denial, clinging to old ideas about life and work and community. The most visible alternative, hip hippies and peace activists left over from an earlier generation's counterculture, had appeared to us to have degenerated into caricature. Reading books and music magazines and talking to older Athens artists and University of Georgia professors, we learned about creative communities in Paris and London and New York, places that had nurtured earlier rebels from the beats and the jazz musicians and the abstract painters to the rockers and the drag queens and the punks. Some of us even got to know nearby folk artists and musicians, people who followed their own visions right here at home. We longed to send our yawp over the roofs of the world too, to live for music and art and sex, to be daring, original and important. Why the hell not? We did not want to be rednecks or racists or conservative Christians or live in subdivisions or work as middle managers. We dreamed not of the Reagan era Sunbelt, but a different world, a new, new South. And in the university's libraries and archives and studios and galleries and concert halls and the town's old buildings, we found the resources to try to make that world a reality. From the late 70s origins of Bohemian Athens to the early 90s when Seattle became the center of alternative culture, the Athens scene produced amazingly good music, from famous groups like the B-52s, REM, and Widespread Panic, to critics' darlings like Pylon and Vic Chestnut, and acts that built a grassroots fan base one show at a time, like the Squalls and Mercyland. But the scene also transformed the punk idea that anyone could start a band, into the even more radical idea that people in unlikely places could make a new culture and imagine new ways of thinking about the meaning of the good life. The history of the Athens scene proves that people you would not expect in places that you have not thought about can create a better world. It also reveals how cultural rebellion can transform human experience. Okay, I just wanted to start with that because it's a little bit of setting a scene and just a little bit of gesturing at some of the larger themes that the book tries to cover. I mean, of course, this book tells the story of the, of the famous and not so famous bands from Athens. But as a cultural historian, I also wanted to get at some of the larger issues and some of the themes, some of the things that are going on in American history more generally in this period. So I, I really wrote this book for two reasons. Um, the first was to give Athens the history that it deserves. Um, the Athens scene um, really deserved to have its history written in a serious way, and that hadn't happened yet. Um, and in 2009, late 2009, um, Vic Chestnut, who had been a friend of mine, died. Um, and that made me realize that people weren't always gonna be around for me to talk to and that if this was going to be done, somebody was going to need to get started. Um, and I kept hoping that would be somebody else because um, I'm someone who has done a lot of my research and work on white supremacy um, and issues of race in the South. And this is a little bit outside of the bailiwick of the kind of work that I usually do. But since no one seemed to be stepping forward um, in about 2013, I decided uh, I had to get in there and get to work on it. 
Um, and what I wanted to do in writing that history of Athens was to do two things simultaneously, deconstruct the myth of Athens, um, which was created mostly by early underground music critics, while also telling what I think is the far more interesting real story of the place um, that, uh, that is left out to some degree in that myth. So if, you, if you're at this event, you probably have some idea of the myth of Athens, but briefly, in case you don't, there's a kind of idea that there are these you know, naturally eccentric people that just happen to pop up in places like Athens because the South is such a weird, isolated place. Um, this is again a, a myth created mostly by underground music critics, most of whom had never been to the South. Um, and that these folks, these eccentric Southerners, um, can do these really interesting things because all they want to do is um, have fun and they care about art, but they don't care about money or fame. So that became a kind of central myth about Athens. There's maybe some truth in parts of that, but it's certainly not really um, an accurate description. Um, to me, the truth is far more interesting. Um, and that is that this scene doesn't grow out of some natural propensity of Southerners to be weird and eccentric um, because of their isolation and backwardness. But instead, it grows out of the scene grows out of the ways in which people in Athens actually have connections to things that are going on in other places and the ways that they're inspired by what's going on at the big giant public university right in the middle of their town. So the main thing I think that people don't know about Athens is that it really, really owes a huge debt to queerness and gay culture and drag and other kinds of performance practices. Um, not everyone who participated in the scene, I think, really even knows about this history. I can talk more about it um, in the Q&A, but key figures like Jerry Ayers, who later uh, changes his name to Jeremy Ayers, um, Ricky Wilson and Keith Strickland from the B-52s and others, um, really have connections to New York City and to um, the kind of drag performance practices that are going on there. And the B-52s really, I think, is, is, could be thought of in its origins and its first iteration as a kind of performance art practice or a kind of drag performance. Um, the second thing I think that people don't always think enough about is how much the University of Georgia um, inspires what's going on. Uh, sorry, I know this is a UVA event, but you know, let's just put in a plug for the value of big public universities in general. But in Athens, of course, that university is, is Georgia. And the ways that people um, actually uh, have access to resources, um, the libraries, the music libraries, the film libraries, the old magazines that are in the library, the spaces, the art studios, um, the exhibition spaces, the music practice rooms, all of those spaces, and even, shockingly enough, a few key professors who really inspire uh, students to get out there and try to do their own forms of art and music. And then finally, I think the other sort of thing that's really central to the reason this scene emerges in Athens is what people at the time called folk culture. It's a word that we don't really love now. It's not really an ideal wor word, but that is the word people used in the past. And these are both visual artists and musicians who are not formally trained, who live in the countryside around Athens. And many young folks in Athens are introduced to these people through a class of all things that operates at Georgia run by Art Rosenbaum and another professor, Andy Nassis. But that is another sort of central stream into the creation of the Athens scene. Um, that's enough about the roots. I think the other sort of central theme of the scene is amateurism, not just in relation to individuals who don't necessarily uh, have long practice on their instrument. Athens bands are famous for people learning to play their instrument while they're in a band. If you don't like Athens music, you, you might have that as the reason. You might have that as a critique. If you do like Athens music, you might say, wow, look at the originality. Um, look what people can come up with. So that can cut either way. But also amateurism in relation to a place. Athens isn't a place that any big important bands had ever come from before this time. Um, and people didn't, there weren't clubs, there weren't music, um, there weren't uh, record companies, there weren't lawyers to help you with your contracts. Ricky Wilson had to go to the U University of Georgia Law Library to look up contracts when he was trying to negotiate the B-52's uh, record contract, first contract. So that kind of amateurism is really, really important. If punk music taught people that anybody could play, um, Athens taught people that anyone could play anywhere, that you didn't have to move to New York or LA 
handful of other spots, but you could just, wherever you were, no matter how isolated or backwards it seemed to be or cut off from the main sort of currents of American culture, you could make your own art and music in that place. Um, and in that way, I think we need to think about how um, these indie and alternative scenes in this period, along with other forms of Gen X cultural rebellion, like the hip hop scenes that are bubbling up at the same moment in the Bronx and in Brooklyn and in other cities, how those young people in the 80s are inventing what later gets called DIY or do it yourself. Um, that, that idea that the most meaningful culture is what you make yourself with your friends, that that's the most authentic, um, that that's the most important, that becomes a really central theme of American culture more broadly. And I don't think we give those Gen X young people enough credit for thinking about that. And that really is a segue into the second thing, reason that I wrote that, this book, and I've already to some degree talked about it, and that is that I thought it was important to put this Gen X cultural rebellion um, uh, not just the Athens scene, but other, other forms of it as well, into the larger story of America. We've had endless books about the hippies and their rebellion. We know all about it. We know about forms of cultural rebellion in the 70s. Um, nobody's taken seriously these forms of rebellion that are happening in the 80s and 90s, um, these youth cultures and subcultures. Um, you know, people do take the music seriously. We've had great books written about hip hop music as music, for example. But I think it's important to think about this in the broader sort of sweep of American cultural history. Um, I think that's probably enough. Now I'm just going to play a couple of clips. I've tried to collect some sort of, you know, clips that everyone wouldn't necessarily have seen of, especially of, of Athens musicians in very early iterations before they become famous. And it's fun to see how I mean, this is for the older folks among us, how young these people looked at the time. So I'm gonna just try to use the share screen function here and then just play you a few, a few clips. Um, let's see, hopefully this is working. Okay, so that is obviously the B-52s and a really, really early picture. Um, I'm, next, I'm going to go to a slide where I'm going to show you a clip of them playing early in 1978 at a, at a they created an event, um, they put it on themselves at a, at a cafe restaurant in Atlanta, um, playing for music, from, from music, I mean, excuse me, from uh, uh, the major, major labels that were courting them at the time. There was nowhere in Athens for them to play for those A&R people, um, so they had to, to rent a place in Atlanta. And the reason we have this really wonderful video and recording that I'm about to show you is because a bunch of Georgia State students, quote unquote, borrowed the equipment from the Georgia State um, television studio and the TV department and took it uh, out at night um, and used it to record this gig. So I'm gonna play a little clip of that. So this is early, early, early B-52's history. <laughs> want to see more early B-52s, you can find a lot of recordings from that show floating around on YouTube, and it's really, really a wonderful time capsule. Um, the next band I want to just play a little clip of their music uh, is, is Pylon. Really, if you have to pick sort of one quintessential Athens scene band, um, many people would, of course, go with the famous R.E.M., but in terms of their impact on what's happening in Athens, and the sort of myth and image of the scene. I think Pylon would really have to be a contender. Um, this is their second, a picture from their very second performance. This is an upstairs space on College Avenue for those of you who have your Athens geography down. Um, uh, it's a, it, a really an illegal loft they're playing in, would be the best way to describe it. Um, and it's their second gig. Um, but the clip that I'm gonna show you uh, play 
show a play a clip of is actually from them playing in New York City in about a year later in 1980. I could keep listening to that, but I'll, I'll stop it for now. Um, she, there's a great story about Vanessa the very first time they played in New York City. Uh, they opened for Gang of Four at Club Hurrah, and she talked the uh, security guard out of his whistle, and then that became a kind of big part of the show. So let's go on to, of course, the most famous band. Sorry. Um, this is a great shot, I think. It's a picture by Laura Levine, so shout out credit to her. Um, because it shows R.E.M. in R.A. Miller's Whirly Gig Garden. So you get a sense of that um, intersection between the music scene and the world um, of rural folk artists. Um, but the clip I'm going to play you is from a show in Raleigh, um, North Carolina. I think this is 1984, but that might be wrong. Sorry, I didn't make a note of it. Oh, here I got it. Yes, 1984. Um, no, nope. Sorry, 1982. This is a 1982 show. I love that clip because you get to see um, Pete Buck and, um, and, and Michael Stipe doing their best Rolling Stones imitation there where they're flirting with each other. Uh, uh, and Mike, Michael Stipe is wearing uh, eye makeup and, you know, that wonderful kind of uh, homage to, uh, to old rock and roll that's going on in that scene. We're skipping ahead here, not time for everyone, but the, the last clip I want to play you is a, is a clip of a musician who really doesn't appear um, in the scene or become really known until the late 80s. Um, and that is um, really, uh, he becomes one of the best songwriters in America. I would argue, and, and others besides me as well. He, he gets ranked that way in Pitchfork and places like that. Um, and that is Athens uh, musician Vic Chestnut. Um, uh, he uh, doesn't put out any albums until the early 90s, but he's playing all the time in the late 80s. For a while, he plays the 40 watt every Tuesday, and the posters eventually don't even have his name. They just say, until hell freezes over, because everybody knows it's Tuesday. Vic's gonna play. So I'm gonna try to play you a clip from this uh, song, Speed Racer, off of his um, first album. If I learned anything from all of these lectures, I think it's my attention span a clip to buy TV at an early age Well, who heard the radio when you are five years old? I used to watch the 
Okay, sorry. Um, I'm going to stop the screen share. Uh, so Vic Chestnut, if you don't know much about him, that's something you can spend if you, if you happen to be one of those people who has some free time right now going down that rabbit hole. But the very first time I ever saw Vic, I can't say I met him, he was sitting on North Campus near the Arch at a rickety um, card table with a, with a poster board in front of it. I couldn't read what was on the sign, but he was passing out little pamphlets um, when I went to Georgia, that's where people would proselytize. The watch people would pass out the watchtower there, for example, and others would preach or pass out uh, Bibles. Um, but Vic actually, um, when I got closer, I realized again I didn't know it was Vic uh, that the sign said "God is dead," and he was passing out pamphlets about atheism. Um, and that was just the kind of cantankerous thing that Vic would do because um, you had to actually get really close to him to know that he wasn't pushing, pushing his religion, or I guess he was pushing his religion, but his anti-religion. Um, that, was, that was a Vic performance art for sure. Um, I wanna open up the floor to questions, but given what's going on in America, I just wanna throw out there one possible topic of discussion that people don't often necessarily even think about, but I think they should when they think about um, music scenes and indie and alternative culture in the 80s and 90s. And that is the role of race um, and racism and segregation in these scenes. Um, so I, I guess I, I would just say briefly, and then certainly if anybody wants to follow up on this in the Q&A, we can talk more about it. Um, you know, I think that in Athens at the, in the time, the sort of golden age of the scene of the late 70s, 80s, and early 90s, let me not say golden age, frankly, let me take that back, actually, because I think the Athens scene is incredibly rich all, all the way up till today, so I, I'm not going to say that. But during the period that my book is about, Cool Town, not a golden scene, but a time period, um, you know, there, there, there are young people trying to practice a kind of anti-racism that is modeled in part on the kind of overt racism that they see around them. I mean, this is a time at the University of Georgia where frat, frat boys, I mean, I'm sorry, that's mostly who does it, um, are driving around yelling the N-word at people. Um, it's a time of overt racism. Um, that is still a thing in the South in the late 70s and 80s. Um, maybe it's back, I hope, you know, to some degree it seems to be back. If you live in Charlottesville, you've certainly You've certainly seen it, but, um, but one of the things I think that is interesting about this scene is that many of the young people in it, and the scene is not entirely white, there are, there are people of color, there are African Americans, Asian Americans, and Latinx folks in the scene, but it's more white than not white. These are folks who are, who've lived through school integration. Almost all of the people in any of the bands that you've heard of, the bands that I've played today, lived through um, the integration of their public or if they happen to go to them private schools, but mostly public, in their, in their high school years or in their middle school years. Um, so it's something people had lived up close and really were trying to figure out a way, um, a way that wasn't that way, that wasn't a kind of overt white supremacy. Um, but I think the limits of that vision, at least in the Athens scene, it, are the ways in which trying to be anti-racist um, in a way that we would probably now describe as colorblindness, I mean, there's limits to that. There's really, there's really limits to what that kind of strategy can accomplish. Um, and I think that you see that playing out in the Athens scene. Um, certainly there are microaggressions, certainly there are assumptions about, about race doesn't matter in ways that are way more appealing to white scene participants than they're going to be to scene participants of color. And then also the way the scene actually interacts with the, um, the music scene that is very much a part of working class black Athens. Um, and I think, again, I think there you see both the possibilities and the limitations. So you have seen people going to Gresham's Disco, you have them going to Hawaii High Lie to see, you know, live black music and loving it. You don't have people from those communities coming very often into a place like the 40 Watt to see music. 
um, there, is a, there is a kind of mismatch between a culture that really appreciates craft and practice and being amazing, um, you know, musicianship. Um, you know, to put it bluntly, a lot of, a lot of folks in um, Athens that are from the African American community don't know why anyone would want to play to see, to pay money to see somebody play who doesn't really know how to play their instrument. <laughs> so there is a kind of mismatch there between um, what these music worlds are interested in and thinking about. So if anybody wants to explore that more in the Q&A, it seems to me, given what's going on in America right now, it's certainly worth talking about, but it is something that I devote a fair amount of time to in the book. Um, and I think it's worth really thinking about both in terms of the sort of quote unquote good intentions of a lot of white people in the scene, but also the ways in which their attempts to imagine a world in which white supremacy, you know, a South that was not sort of based on white supremacy, the ways that that vision falls short. But with that said, um, I think Joshua is going to be our moderator. So I hope I didn't go on too long and let's open up for questions. Thank you, Grace. That was great. So we're going to open up for questions. Um, all right, so let's start out with, here we go. Um, from Tao, he says, or she actually, are most college towns filled with colorful and eccentric characters? Well, I think, you know, I certainly haven't been to every college town, although as, as Joshua suggested, I have given a lot of talks, a lot of places, and a lot of more <laughs> college towns, <laughs> all of them. But certainly there is a, a tradition of tolerating, um, in a lot of college towns, of tolerating more ec eccentricity, of tolerating behavior that um, might not be considered respectable in other places. There is something of that tradition, but I do think part of the reason why we think college towns are full of eccentric, quirky people is just this moment when, um, and Athens is the first of these really important college town scenes. It's because of places like Athens and how they inspire people in other college towns that we have that idea of college towns. Now, I, I wanna sort of be really careful with that. Like there are certainly eccentric people in college towns before that, but the fact that that is the kind of image of college towns owes a lot to this time period and to the fact that, you know, bands like REM played in places like Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and then kids would start a, a REM cover band. And then before you know it, there's a record store. And then there's a little scene in Tuscaloosa. Right. And that kind of thing would happen time and time again. And not just with REM, although they were they were key, key band in terms of where they would tour and they would play any anywhere. Um, they play a huge role in this. But same thing will happen in a place like Lawrence, Kansas, Lawrence, Kansas. You know, bands will come through there. Locals will start copying them. And then before you know it, you've got a little bit of a scene there. So, yes, there is some eccentricity. And and some people who are less charitable would say there's a tolerance for people not growing up in college towns. <laughs> um, but I do think that our sort of today's image of college towns owes a lot to this 80s and 90s um, indie culture. Great, thank you. Um, David, being in Athens during this time period and known in some of the music scene, I did not realize how big and unique the music scene was. It was just UGA students. I didn't know how special it was until I went to UVA in the late 80s. When did you realize how unique it was? Um, you know, I, I felt like when I was living through it that it was really special. My brother used to always tell me, he lived in Atlanta, that Athens wasn't the center of the world. And so I think I, <laughs> I, think I had it a bit when I, was, when I was living there. It felt very much like history was being made. I, I'm not even sure I was entirely always right, but we, we had this sort of feeling of that momentous things were happening. Um, but I, I will say that when the speaker, it, it's interesting, the, the question, the person who asked the question, when I moved to Charlottesville, that was the moment that I knew that Athens was really <laughs> exciting because <laughs> Charlottesville in the late 90s was not very exciting. <laughs> so. But it's a great college, so I was glad to have the job. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, David. Um, Bo Heiner has a question. He said, do you have thoughts on the Athens Inside Out documentary? Yeah, you know, one of the fun things in the book was actually um, 
getting to find out more about the history of that, about that movie, um, which really shaped a lot of people's perception of, of Athens. It used to play on MTV, you know, uh, pre-internet days, but it would sort of play in fairly heavy rotation on MTV. And they would do things like, you know, have a contest where somebody would win a weekend in Athens after they played it, like a weekend with Mark Klein of Love Tractor in Athens. And so people, you know, people love this, these prizes. They'd come to Athens for the weekend, but, but it also would play in college movie theaters and, and sort of art house theaters. And it really shaped a lot of people's vision of Athens. Um, I got to interview the, the, one of the filmmakers. Um, and one thing that I hadn't really known about the film was how influential Jerry, who by that point had decided to change his name to Jeremy Ayers was in making that film. I sort of mentioned him earlier and he's really in many ways, if you have to pick one key figure in the Athens scene, he would be the one. Um, he grew up in Athens. His dad was a religion professor at Georgia. Um, he moved as you had to do back then if you were interesting and wanted to make your own art, he moved to New York City. Um, and there he became a part of Andy Warhol's factory in the 70s, um, remade himself as the drag queen Silva Thin, hung out with all the famous Warhol superstars, became a superstar Warhol superstar himself. And um, Ricky Wilson and Keith Strickland took the bus from Athens up to visit him in New York. Um, um, and this was really a formative time. So in some ways you could argue that, that Athens was, the scene is started by people who were trying to recreate the, the factory Seen now, I've actually lost the thread of the question. Okay, sorry, I got off on that tangent. Remind <laughs> me where we were going, Joshua. <laughs> oh, the Inside Out documentary. Oh, the Inside Out. So Jeremy Ayers actually, at first, doesn't really want to have anything to do with the filmmakers, but then, for then for some reason, decides that he will have something to do with them, and he writes them out lists of things that have to be in the in the in the sh in the movie, who they have to interview, what bands have to be included. Um, and according to the filmmakers, they pretty much followed that. So um, to some degree, uh, Athens, Athens Inside and Out is Jeremy Ayers' vision of Athens. Um, it's, it's Athens as full of quirky, eccentric, male creative people. Um, and that is part of the scene. Um, what I don't like about that vision is that it leaves out the fact that there are a lot of people involved in the scene who happen to be women. And there, there are a few women in Athens Inside Out, but mostly it's quirky um, male um, folk artists and, and musicians. Um, that sort of, it sort of reimagines the Athens scene as everybody is a quirky folk, folky artist person. Um, and as I said, that's part of it, but it's only part. Ben Pugh has a question. Uh, in the Siva in the 80s, or 80s Siva was noted uh, live music hotbed and a cradle of blues revival and roots rock, as was Austin, Texas, built smaller southern cities um, with major public universities having parallels to Athens. How would you compare and contrast them? Um, you know, to some degree, I think each scene has its own unique history. Um, I certainly know, I mean, I know a little bit about Charlottesville just from, from being here, more about Charlottesville in the 90s than I do the 80s, to be fair, um, and the era, era of, the, of, the, of the house over on the corner that was so famous for music and the guys that created bands like Pavement, uh, et cetera. Um, but Austin has its own particular music history that has interesting connections to cowboy music and country music and what later will be called alt country, which is not a term people have at the time. So in no way am I trying to suggest that no place else has music. Um, but in terms of indie culture and, in, and this idea that you have to create your own original music, that you're not, it's not some sort of revival or some sort of continuation of a tradition, which I think are incredibly wonderful ways to make music. I'm not suggesting they aren't. But in terms of this idea that you have to make your own music, don't play covers, don't play the guitar like anybody else, create your own original sound. Not saying they always pull that off either. Um, that's so much a part of indie alt culture. Um, Athens has a very different story than Charlottesville and Austin in those moments. Great, thank you. Uh, Ron Warren has a question. What venues other than the 40 watt, the Georgia Theater, and of course the downstairs were important uh, to the Athens music scene in the 1980s? Um, you know, the Uptown Lounge, I think, is a place that's really, really important. Um, you, you know, there, there's a time when the only club in town for a brief 
brief period is the 40 watt and uh, the guy who owns it decides to take the entire month of August off because the college students have left. So he's not going to sell enough alcohol to make enough money. <laughs> so if it shuts down, there's nowhere to play. So in many ways, the Uptown Lounge starts because people are really, really anxiously looking for a, another venue at that time. And they talk a guy who owns a bar. Um, it had been a triple X movie theater. So it's can't say it's a fancy place. Um, and I don't, it seemed like they never even cleaned it after they switched over from triple X movies to, uh, to a really dirty bar. But it then became a venue that really nurtured a whole generation of bands like the Barbecue Killers, Mercy Land, Porn Orchard, et cetera, um, and a harder edge sound. And that's a really Kilkenny Cats too, really important sort of era in Athens music. Um, so I would definitely say um, the Uptown Lounge, um, the guy who runs it eventually buys the Georgia Theater and makes it a full-time music venue before it burns down and comes back in its current incarnation, um, Kyle Pilgrim. So that that's a really important club. And and also places like the Grit, I mean, I used the downstairs I mentioned, but the places that are quieter, that are smaller, that can can, can um, be a good space for more acoustic music or different kinds of, you know, softer sounds. Um, uh, those places are important as well. And then later there's all kinds of new clubs coming on. There is a moment in Athens where there are three different clubs that have 40 watt in the name. So I, I'm not going to go all through with the ins and outs of that. It's confusing even to me. I had to make a chart to keep it straight. But, um, but, uh, but I think the main one that you didn't mention, the questioner didn't mention was um, Uptown Lounge. Perfect. Thank you. We have two questions that have to do with um, the band's support. So one asked, did you feel the community really supported the bands or was it the university? And then uh, one person asked, what was the university's attitude and or were those two worlds completely separate? Yeah. Well, you know, what's really funny is when my kids were in high school in Charlottesville, they started getting mail from colleges. And the first mail they got from University of Georgia um, was a postcard and it said like all the like reasons why you should come to Georgia and one of them was like you know shop in the like bohemian shops downtown and like go catch a show at the 40 watt and it, it that was you know just as important as as Georgia football in selling the college to um to prospective students they didn't you know they didn't send a special card to my students since I my kids since I was writing a book about Athens so I found that to be really really terrific because back in the day the university was was pretty much like we want to pretend like this isn't happening here um now that's not to say that some professors um weren't super supportive and people use the spaces and you know b-52s for example played memorial hall and later they played the coliseum um you know they could you know the, the the university concert division that was run by students put on concerts of athens bands famous free rem shows on legion field anybody out there in the audience get to go to any of those shows they were amazing they played at least three um free shows on legion field but but um but but the university administration like upper level administration the admissions office those people they were like we don't see anything nothing going on here nothing <laughs> weird going on here at all we don't we can't see it we don't we don't want to know about it um so that was that was really interesting the support came from the community but also from college students for sure and not even just the students who who would sort of start to call themselves townies or you know real core scene people um, but even from students that were more um, more sort of mainstream or conventional students um, would really come out to see some bands not all bands but but some bands so a huge amount of support from people connected to UVA but not from the sort of official UVA administration um, but but the community um, for sure support from the community fantastic uh, we have someone, Alan R. Grace, loved your book. One of the real stars in my read was Michael Lachowski. Lachowski, yeah. It's, it's, not, it's not spelled the way it sounds, so no worries. I tried. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, his talent stood out in the arts, design, and music. Can you share more about Michael? Oh, yeah. I mean, Michael, you know, I could talk forever about Pylon and Michael is um, key to Pylon. He's the bass player for Pylon. He and Randy Bewley 
really create Pylon. Um, originally, they, their idea is to create a performance art project. They're both art students. This is just so art school. And um, they're going to create a band and they're going to get a gig in New York and get written up in the New York music press. And then they're going to disband because the whole point is this is just an art project to see if we can actually accomplish this goal of getting a mention. Um, and that, that is the origins of Pylon. But Michael Lahusky is just a really interesting artist for an undergraduate. So many people that I interviewed, and of course this is, you know, decades after they were in school with him, said, you know, he was a real artist. He was the one student who seemed like he was a real artist in school. Everybody looked up to him. Everybody thought he was talented. The professors thought he was talented. And he um, was a photography major, but he are always had this idea that he could experiment across genres. So he won, for example, an, um, the art show at the Linden House one year with a with a sculpture, he made one of the lights in the parking lot. He transformed that by adding sort of pieces of tubing, et cetera, to it into a light and water sculpture. And he won, he won the art show. Um, so he had this idea that he could, that, that starting to play music um, and creating a band was just like any other artistic medium, that if he could work across these mediums that he had no training in, why couldn't he do that with music? And so um, he he and and Randy Buley Randy Buley got a guitar and uh, they got the guitar at the one at the pawn shop and one from a thrift store. I don't remember which was which right offhand. I should have made notes, but they got these two used instruments and just started you know playing around with them in um, La Husky's uh, art studio, which was in that space downtown, that illegal loft that I was showing you before. Um, and they, and out of that evolved the band Pylon. Um, they, they actually, um, they had people um, audition to become their singer. Um, and they turned, of course, to their fellow art, art students. This was an art project. So they weren't looking for musicians. They were looking for other art students that they found interesting. Um, and that's how they found Vanessa. She had graduated by then, but she and Randy had been good friends in the art school. Um, and, uh, and, and uh, Curtis Crow, the drummer, was also an art student um, who, uh, who was the fourth member of that band. Um, they, were just, they were just really, really amazing. I mean, I think one more thing to say about them is that, and this came a lot from, from um, Michael, but other members too, they created this industrial aesthetic in the early years. The pylon is actually like a orange safety cone. It, most of, you, most of you in this audience probably know that, but people are constantly arguing with me that this band is named after um, Faulkner's novel, Pylon. Um, or, and, and I'm having to always argue with them that that's actually not true. A music critic got that wrong years ago and somehow that's stuck in people's minds. But um, they created this industrial aesthetic um, about the sort of safety um, in industrial spaces. And that was because three of them worked, including Michael Lahusky, at the DuPont Nylon Factory, which was still operating in Athens at the time and they work there on the weekends. Um, they would pull double shifts on the weekends and make enough money not to have to work the rest of the week. And so they took their early aesthetic from all the sort of safety materials at the, at the DuPont nylon factory. I could go on, but that's probably enough anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. Karen has a question. Did the British New Wave and punk movement have much effect on or interaction with the Athens scene? Yeah, I mean, punk's certainly huge, but I would say more than British punk, not, not that British punk had no influence, but it would be more New York punk. So it's more, you know, sort of that, that history that goes from the Velvet Underground to the Ramones, the New York Dolls, television, talking heads, that, that kind of trajectory. New York punk, Patti Smith, huge influence, Patti Smith on everybody from, from Vanessa Briscoe Hay and, um, Pylon also influenced very much by people like Yoko Ono, who also influenced um, Kate Pearson and, and um, uh, uh, Cindy Wilson from the B-52s. But, but people from that early, that New York underground world, huge, huge impact. I mean, British punk, to a lesser degree, some, some key people in the scene went to that famous um, Sex Pistols show. Sex Pistols' first show in America was in Atlanta in a club that was in a strip mall of all places. 
I mean, I guess that's very punk if you think about it. Um, and some people did go to that. Pete Buck claims he got thrown out of that show. Um, so people, some people went to that. But, um, but I would say more British post-punk, um, even more than new wave bands like Gang of Four, hugely influential. Um, uh, Pylon played their first New York gig with them, played with them also in Philadelphia and later toured with them through the Midwest and California. And Athens people were huge Gang of Four fans and other bands for sure like that. Um, but that post-punk music almost more than British punk. Great. Uh, Caroline asks, did these bands have inherent desire to make it big in music or were they content to stay local and play their music? Um, and when did they know they were going to launch to a bigger audience and uh, did have the success they did? Yeah, um, you know, I mean, I think it's a hard question to answer because different people have different ambitions for their music. Um, and so the, there's a lot of variation across the scene. But I do think one thing that's really powerful, and, and this is a real difference between indie culture and hip hop culture, is that in indie, the indie music world, you're supposed to act like you don't care about the money. And I think that shows us something about the mostly white middle class roots of these scenes. Um, whereas hip hop artists are very much about um, performing a kind of desire for luxury and money. Again, that's not saying that's their essential identity, that their greatest desire as a human is for that, but the way that the scene puts that out there as an image. So it's very much a part of the Athens scene and Athens is really a place where this starts and spreads to other parts of indie, the indie world. It's just not cool to have a kind of naked financial ambition. Um, that doesn't mean some people don't for sure, but they got to hide it. They got to keep it, keep it on the down low and people, people do. And, but people think it's unseemly to be, again, rightly or wrongly, unseemly to be too ambitious. You've got to, you've got to be, you can be ambitious for your art, but you can't be ambitious for, for money or major record label, major deals, you know, that, that's just not, that's not acceptable in the scene. And so, I mean, I think REM is the band that navigates that the most successfully because they clearly have a lot of ambition at a very early point, I mean, from the start. But at the same time, they're very good at keeping that sort of a little bit under the surface there in those early years when that's, a, when that's considered unfairly a mark against a band in Athens. Um, and they're often, sometimes they're accused in those early years of the scene of being too interested in, you know, being a sellout or being too interested in being popular, as if having a lot of people listen to your music is a bad thing, right? But that is a part of the ethos. We have a couple uh, <laughs> of questions um, focusing on a comparison. I'll be interested to hear, actually. So we have Dave Matthews to Charlottesville is like REM to Athens. That, that's good. That's really good. And, you know, I'm not going to say more than how you, how you like those bands will say a lot about what you think about those scenes. So if you think that if you are a huge Dave Matthews fan, then you probably think that Charlottesville in the 90s is the center of the world, you know. Um, if you're not such a big uh, Dave Matthews fan or you're a huge REM fan, you know, that gives you a different perspective. But yes, I think that's a really, really wonderful comparison. Um, bizarrely enough, I lived for only until very recently, I lived the whole time I've lived in Charlottesville on the circle where the Dave Matthews band started in Dave Matthews' mother's basement. And so it was bizarre because having lived in Athens where you'd see people like trying to find Michael Stipe's house or Pete Buck's house, and then to live in Charlottesville on the street where people are coming around trying to find <laughs> the place where Dave Matthews band started. Um, but I was actually out in front of my house gardening right when I moved into it. And I, you know, I'm down in the dirt, you know, weeding. And this guy comes up, this handsome, you know, guy, a little bit younger than me, not much, but and, uh, he goes, hi. And of course, I immediately knew, know who he is, but he goes, hi, like I wouldn't know who he is. And he goes, right. I'm Dave Matthews. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> I figured that, out. I figured that out. You know, I'm like, I can't shake your hand. I'm down here in the dirt weeding. But, um, but uh, I, I think one other comparison besides just the, the fame and importance of those bands and their, you know, how they become such major bands in the larger music world, and then they put a place on the map for music. 
Um, and the, Ma the Dave Matthews Band certainly does that for Charlottesville. And that's a good comparison to REM. But the other thing I think is the way that those bands have seen themselves as rooted in those places and, um, and donated uh, money to really to local causes. I mean, there's a huge kind of effect of that in Athens of, of money that is donated by REM to, to local causes and support for local musicians and, and, and that kind of stuff. And then in, in, in Charlottesville, you see the work that the, that the, the what is it, Bama Works Foundation, if I got the name right, but Dave Matthews right. has a foundation and they give, um, they give to many, many worthwhile local causes and try to make a difference in their town. And I think, again, beyond the music, that's a really important linkage between those two bands that they both they both felt like they needed to give back to their communities fantastic that's a good question to end on talking about athens and moving up in charlesville with dave matthews and rem hand in hand um but thank you miss hale for giving such a fantastic presentation and thank you all for coming out tonight um if you had any questions um we will try to get them answered I'm sure I could share them with Grace and then share them back out. Um, but yes, thank you all for coming. Yeah, and, thanks. Um, you. Yeah, what to say? And um, have a great night. Yeah. And thanks to Daniil for making us uh, everything run so smoothly. We had. I no say, Daniil, you can bring your screen back. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. No glitches here, and that yep. must have been your your skill. Thank you. And have a great night, everybody. See ya. Bye.